All right, some news just in here on Philadelphia 76ers. Now, that's why I'm coming to you from the at-home studio. According to Shams Taranya, after Joel Embiid was named MVP last night, a wonderful honor, which is a massively important moment in the city of Philadelphia, considering everything that he's been through, it really does punctuate the process era and everything that Joel Embiid embodies about the city of Philadelphia. He turned to his teammates and he said, I'm back. Joel Embiid is expected to return to action, get back on the hardwood for Game 2 against the Boston Celtics. Let's get to that. Let's also talk about Embiid winning MVP. Before we dive in, please make sure you subscribe to the channel. We did a watch party the other night for Game 1. James Harden, 45 points, the game-winning 3. We were going nuts, and we're running it back again tonight. Watch party on 76ers now. Subscribe and join us. We're growing the channel here. Year-round content. Content on all things 76ers. Lock us in and subscribe. You will not be disappointed with our coverage. You're home for great Sixers coverage here on YouTube. So according to Shams, Joel Embiid is going to return for Game 2 against the Boston Celtics in TD Garden. And this comes as a little bit of a surprise. I thought that with the Sixers stealing away home court advantage in Game 1, by stealing Game 1 on the road, thanks to James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, Tobias Harris, DeAnthony Melton, a collective effort in which Doc Rivers abused Joe Mazzulla like a punching bag, that the Sixers were going to sit Joel Embiid. And for Embiid, he wasn't going to play in Game 2. And it made sense, right? It affords him some extra time to get some rest. You come back on Friday to the Wells Fargo Center for Game 3. At the very worst, the series is going to be tied 1-1. You get some extra days to heal up that knee. The arena is going to be popping off once Embiid is named MVP in front of the Philadelphia faithful. And then he returns for Game 3. But credit to Joel Embiid here. In an era of load management, when a lot of players would never play in these circumstances, Embiid wants to be with his teammates. He wants to partake in this playoff series, and he wants to play. This is something that Kawhi Leonard would never do. And while Embiid has been somewhat brittle throughout his career, suffering from a lot of injuries, this is why I have mad respect for him. In the playoffs, he's played with the meniscus injury. He's played with a torn thumb, thumb ligament. He's played with an orbital fracture. And now he has this grade 2 LCL sh sprain, which usually is a four to six week injury. And he's going to give it a go in game two. This is a very interesting scenario here. And I think that Doc Rivers has to tread very lightly. The Sixers looked like a pretty solid basketball team in Game 1. Now, of course, you can't count on James Harden night in, night out to give you 45 points. And at this point of his career, he's not in a spot or in a position where he can hand you 45, light it up from deep, and hit that cold-blooded, dribble-through-the-leg step back in the mug of Al Horford. Shout out Anna Horford, right? If Embiid clearly is not right, and if Embiid is struggling, if he's laboring because he hasn't done much over the last week and a half, you have to pull the plug. And you have to get him out, get him out of the basketball game. Paul Reed was able to hold his own. Him hitting four of four free throws in crunch time against the Celtics was really impressive. Hashtag out the mud. The real ones know. And this Sixers team has shown by going 13-5 and without Embiid this year that they can win without Joel Embiid. So if he is negatively affecting the game, get him out and don't play him and see what the Sixers can do here. Again, two things can be true. I can respect Joel Embiid for playing in this game too. I respect the passion that he has for the game of basketball and the will to win here. But if it's negatively impacting the offensive flow, and he's not the same guy defensively as a rim protector, the Sixers needed that in game one. The backdoor cuts, the entry passes, they were terrible in that category, although they did make some second half adjustments and Jason Tatum went cold there in that second half, so too did Jalen Brown, then that's kind of the line that you have to toe here between... Wanting Embiid back and appreciating his effort 
and the will to be out there because it does require some toughness. I can't imagine that knee is anywhere close to 100%. Shoot, he had to get a platelet-rich plasma injection into that knee to try to speed up the recovery. If he is negatively impacting the team, and sometimes we see especially against teams that are good defensively like the Celtics. When he gets hit with some of those double teams, he gets a little bit flustered, and the game moves too fast for him, and he ends up turning the basketball over. Al Horford, Robert Williams, too, they can do a good job of defending him. That's what has to be going through the mind of Doc Rivers here. Now, keys for game two, you have to be better defensively from the start to the finish. You can't allow the Celtics to have some of those easy looks, getting beat in transition, getting beat in the half court with some of those backdoor cuts, the ball movement in the trenches there in the paint, because the paint points for Boston throughout that game were somewhat problematic. Tyrese Maxey going to have to play well like he did in game one. I respect and I loved how Maxey started off slow. This is a guy who's always struggled against Boston. 10 points per game against the Celtics throughout his career. Sub 35% from three, as well as from twos and from the field. He could have really cratered in that game. But this is a part of that mental toughness that this Sixers team has that they haven't had in previous years. A lot of that thanks to P.J. Tucker, but also... A guy like DeAnthony Melton, where Maxi doesn't get flustered by struggling in the early going and ends up having a really important game for the Sixers. Now, for James Harden, not expecting him to have a repeat performance that he had in Game 1. At this point of his career, like I said, it's very difficult for him to put together consecutive performances like that. But if he does that, that's great. But you saw in Game 1 against the Nets, he was awesome from 3. He was awesome in that game. He paced Philly in that game and was terrific with the vision, with the assists, and in the scoring department. But then the rest of that series, he tailed off a little bit. You already got the James Harden game in this series. You might need another one to beat a really good team like Boston because this series is far from over. But I'm interested to see how James Harden can come out because right from the tip of that game in Game 1, he had a couple of those threes. Both of them should have been fouls on that near side wing because Marcus Smart came down in his landing area. The whistles remained silent, but he realized without Joel Embiid, he had to do his part. He took control of that game from the start to the finish. From the start, hitting a couple of those buckets able to finish around the rim, which he didn't do against Brooklyn, to the end when he hit a couple of those big threes late in the fourth quarter, including the game winner on Al Horford. Tobias Harris, 20 points per game, one of the more efficient offensive players in the first round of the entire NBA playoffs. Big game in game one. He's going to have to play like that too. You had 15 points, I believe, in that first half from DeAnthony Melton. You need some of the bench production as well. And I mentioned P.J. Tucker a little bit earlier. I applauded the signing at the time. The Sixers needed to make a move like that. They had lacked mental toughness. You saw it when they created it against Boston with Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid in their first playoff appearance together when they struggled down the stretch to close out some of those games and a series that they could have won. They really fell apart against the Atlanta Hawks in that seven-game series. They did the same last year against the Miami Heat. P.J. Tucker brings that toughness, that bulldog mentality. He's a pit bull that you do not want to meet in a back alley. Unlike the Memphis Grizzlies, which are all bark, no bite, P.J. Tucker is all bark and some bite. Very good defense. He doesn't give you much offensively, but this is a guy who holds others accountable like he did with Paul Reed. I'm sure a lot of you saw that clip. He can defar uh, defend a Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and a massive, massive culture changer and toughness changer for this team. And Anthony Melton is a part of that as well. Now let's shift gears here to Joel Embiid winning M NBA MVP. Last two years, finished runner-up to Nikola Jokic in this award. He could have won it either of those years. I've continued to say that I believe that Joel Embiid is the better player than Nikola Jokic. Nikola Jokic might be the better all-around offensive player, and he is certainly a unicorn in this league, just like Embiid is. His passing ability is better than Embiid's. His shooting touch might be a little bit better, although that can go to Embiid. How he sets up and orchestrates the offense is different stylistically than Joel. But Joel Embiid is the closest thing physically that we've seen since Shaq. 
He has the footwork of Hakeem Olajuwon. And why I believe that MVP award should go to the player that has their fingerprints all across the game. That's why I believe that Embiid is that guy and the Joker is probably worthy of winning that award the previous two seasons. Where the Joker gets beat out by Embiid is on the defensive end. Embiid can have an off night offensively and still win the game defensively like he did in Game 3 against Brooklyn with that backside block on Spencer Dinwiddie to lock up that victory on the road. If the Joker has a bad game offensively, he can't really impact the game defensively. So I think on both ends, when you account for the overall impact that Embiid does have, he is the better all-around player and sometimes more impactful player, even though he doesn't set up the offense and pass the ball like the Joker, than Nikola Jokic. And what a story it is for Embiid. This is a guy who was late to start his basketball career growing up in Cameroon. He comes to the United States. The clips of him playing high school basketball for the academy that he played at It looked as though he was a gazelle or a deer that just came out the womb and he had never seen or played the game of basketball, didn't understand it, and his legs were wobbly. He didn't know how to control his body and he didn't realize the length and the height that he had. He thought about quitting at Kansas because, and in high school, because people would laugh at him because he wasn't in control of that body. But I'll never forget this game that he played for Kansas at Iowa State, where he was doing the Hakeem the Dream moves with the fake move here, turn around. He was hitting some up and unders. He was blocking shots at Kansas, and you saw the raw ability that he had. And this is where Sam Hinkie comes into play. He saw that ability that Embiid had. At Kansas, And he's like, this guy can be a really special player. It's going to take a little while, but this guy can be a straight-up dog in this league. Then in the pre-draft process, he has this workout where you're seeing the ability that he possesses. And you're like, my goodness, this guy is one of one. And if the game slows down, if he fills out that frame, he has shooting touch from the outside. He can put the ball on the deck. He has that finesse footwork of Hakeem Olajuwon. If he does fill out that body and there was room to fill out that body with some muscle, he can overpower you like Shaquille O'Neal. And all of that has happened. But he gets injured in the pre-draft process. He misses his first two years in the NBA because of the foot injury and the back injury. When he finally does play in his first season, which is year three for him, so the Sixers had to be really, really patient with him. And it was frustrating for fans during that process era because the Sixers were a dog shit organization. He comes back. He plays a little bit more than 30 games. You see some of the potential. The first game that he played, I believe it was against OKC when he was given Steven Adams, a good defensive player that work, he injures his knee. And you're thinking, my gosh, he can't get a break. He's going to be a bust. But to see the development over time, to see how the city has embraced him and how he's tapped into the bulldog, lunch pail to work, blue collar mentality aspect and mindset of Philadelphia has been special. The fan base has been through so much with him. He's been through so much with this fan base. And now it results, after all these playoff shortcomings and heartbreaking losses, the quadruple bounce against Kawhi Leonard in the Eastern Conference semifinals back in 2019, the loss to the Hawks in Game 7, the loss last year to the Heat, he finally gets his flowers, he finally gets the respect And Joel Embiid is named NBA MVP, which is a very, very special honor that forever forever puts him in the pantheon of some of the best NBA players of all time. He was already on a Hall of Fame track, but if he didn't win MVP, you're like, yeah, he was great, but playoff shortcomings, hopefully that comes to an end this year, didn't win an NBA MVP, but look, one of the best defensive players of this generation, one of the most gifted centers of all time, and one of the most unique all-around players that this game has ever seen. Up there with Giannis in terms of when you watch him physically, you're like, 
you're not going to see a lot of players like this. And this is a guy who also had to deal with the tragic loss of his brother, Arthur, who tragically passed away a couple of years ago. And after that, Embiid thought about retiring from the game of basketball. And lastly, let me round out with this. You saw that all of this culminated in him being named MVP last night and what happened when it was made official. He broke down. He was so emotional. He was in tears because he realized from growing up in Cameroon to being a guy who looked like a gazelle coming out the womb who couldn't even move his body in a coherent fashion to going to Kansas, getting dominated there, getting frustrated with his lack of development. People were making fun of him in high school and in college for just being this raw prospect. It's like Bill Self, what do you see here? But Bill Self swore that he was going to be a lottery pick. Not only was he that, he was the top three pick by the Philadelphia 76ers. The injuries, all of the adversity, it has culminated in him winning MVP, which is a very special moment. That's why he broke down, and the reaction from his teammates was also really, really special. Like how James Harden embraced him was a really, really cool moment. And it's a moment that we're, ever, we're, we're, we're forever going to remember here uh, in the history of the Philadelphia 76ers. He now joins the MVPs in this illustrious franchise's history of Allen Iverson back in 2001, Julius Irving, Wilt Chamberlain, and Joel Embiid. Very, very special and a very cool moment that a lot of people can root for. All right, watch party tonight. Join us for game two, the return of JoJo MVP, man. So awesome to talk about this. We'll catch you tonight. Thanks for watching.